He is featured in the new HBO documentary, Baltimore Rising, which documents both his youth education work around public policy and his legislative work around police reform. Love is the co-author of The Black Book, Reflections from the Baltimore Grassroots, a collection of essays that describe important issues facing grassroots activists and organizers. His talk today is When Baltimore Awakes. Please help me in welcoming Davon Love. that I want to address actually is the uh, subject of a publication that my organization just recently put out uh, this past week that you'll be hearing more about. Um, so you actually are the first group that I'm giving a formal presentation to about um, this publication. Before I jump into that though, I just want to just tell you a little bit about myself and my organization because I think it'll help put um, the actual talk in its proper perspective. Um, as was mentioned, um, I'm from Baltimore, um, went to Forest Park High School in Northwest Baltimore, grew up um, over there. Um, and my introduction into advocacy um, was through debate. Baltimore was one of many cities um, in the 80s and 90s um, that became part of the Urban Debate League movement. Um, policy debate is the most rigorous form of academic debate that exists. Um, there are studies that say that a year's of work on policy debates, the equivalent of a master's thesis. Um, and so many of the um, most um, competitively successful debaters um, end up made, working in major public policy think tank institutions. In fact, the NDT has a formal role, the National Debate Tournament, which is one of the major sanctioning bodies of policy debate on the college level. Um, they actually have a formal relationship with CSIS, Center for Strategic International Studies. Um, where two debaters from the NDT um, get internships to work there. Um, and so I actually came into the activity um, of policy debate um, during an intellectual and academic innovation into the activity of policy debate. Where at the University of Louisville, out of their Pan-African Studies Department, Dr. Eddie Warner and Daryl Birch um, were observing, they were looking at the way in which policy debate was overwhelmingly white and elite and thought that if the activity was going to be spread throughout this country um, to black folks, that the pedagogy and research methods that were used in the activity should be reflective of conversations of racism and white supremacy and other forms of oppression. And so they enacted a style of debate that incorporated both academic um, authors, personal experience, and they borrowed uh, from Antonio Gramsci this notion of organic intellectuals, and in their case, they actually used hip hop artists. In the case of many of the debaters, um, the predominantly black debaters that was on their team, as a way to synthesize um, a form of debate that really looked at one's social location um, and required a more critical analysis of issues of public policy. And it culminated in the team of Liz Jones and Tanya Green, um, two black women who were in quarterfinals of both national championship tournaments, a policy debate is a two on two activity. My college debate partner actually, he's also from Baltimore, he's a year older than me, and he went to University of Louisville for two years, and then transferred back, he transferred to Towson to debate with me, and Daryl Birch actually moved his whole life from Louisville to Baltimore to train Devin and I. And that culminated in 2008, and Devin and I went in a national championship um, in debate, um, extended on the work that Liz and Tanya and Birch and, and Eddie Warner we're engaged in. Um, and what's important to note about the Pan-African Studies Department at the University of Louisville is one of the principal scholars that was the pillar of that program, Dr. Yon Karou, who actually traveled with Malcolm X in Africa um, while Malcolm was there. Um, so a part of why I, I like to start with that is to kind of give you my own intellectual genealogy. Um, the Daryl Birch, the person that essentially gave me my fundamental intellectual framing, um, is a part of a genealogy of black freedom struggle. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be incubated um, in what we de describe as like an intellectual maroon. Um, for those who aren't familiar with maroonage, um, during enslavement, you had peoples of African enslaved, state, uh, people of African descent, enslaved Africans, who many of them got off 
of the plantations and established their own societies away from enslavement and many times in the mountains. You see a lot of those in the Caribbean. I mean, if you're familiar with Marcus Garvey, his parents actually um, were in maroon societies in the mountains of Jamaica. Um, and so intellectually, uh, many of us who are NLBS co-founders and members uh, were intellectually incubated in a maroon, intellectually. Um, and so that intellectual genealogy is actually really important for the talk um, this morning. Um, when, when Baltimore Awakes, Awakes is a publication that, I, as I mentioned before, we just released. It's 26,000 word critique of the human social service sector here in Baltimore City. And when I talk about the human social service sector, I'm talking generally about education, social work, public health, um, in many of the arenas that deal with human services, some kind of human service delivery. Um, and so this publication is a critique, um, it's an essay, a polemic really, about um, some of the dramatic problems in the human social service sector. I'm going to start, before I jump directly into it, um, just a couple of things. One, um, when Baltimore Awakes is a playoff of Hubert Henry Harrison's 1920 book, When Africa Awakes. Hubert Henry Harrison was actually um, um, a person of African descent who was a part, a big player in the socialist movement in the early 1900s in, in Harlem. Um, and he actually left the socialist movement in many ways, was pushed out um, because of the flaw that he saw um, politically and conceptually in the way that race was theorized. Um, you know, his argument was that uh, many of the institutions, the, the kind of socialist uh, formations that existed at the time um, would talk about race in real abstract rate, ways, but the institutional formation of many of these socialist organizations put at the center the concerns of white folks, um, even though they would speak to issues that were facing black people at the time. Um, when you talk about leadership of organizations, when you're talking about the way that certain issues were framed, um, that in many cases what, what, what Harrison saw was really an exploitative relationship uh, between many of the early socialist formations in the United States and black folks. And so he actually left um, the socialist movement um, and actually um, started working pretty collaboratively with Marcus Garvey um, and the United Negro Improvement Association. In fact, it was Hubert Henry Harrison um, and his Liberty League that was actually the first platform, um, the first major platform that Marcus Garvey had access to to put forward his message. Um, and Hubert Henry Harrison um, and Marcus Garvey had a pretty um, lasting and important working relationship for several years. And the, and the reason why um, I chose to kind of play off of When Africa Awakes is because this is a book where, where Harrison actually is, is very, he talks about his criticisms of the left, of what he describes as the so-called friends of the Negro, and he gives a bunch of examples both of scholars and activists of African descent and of the socialist movement who he felt were advancing forms of advocacy that were exploitative of black folks. Um, and so he would talk about, for instance, um, the Republican Party at the time, which was the party that um, was home to most black folks that participated in politics at the time, um, criticized the way in which um, they would curate leadership of black folks. The Republican Party would select the kinds of black leaders that, most were, in, that were most in line with the agenda of the Republican Party and will allow the Republican Party to both proclaim to be the party for black folks while not giving black people any real representation or power within the actual party itself. He even critiques W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois, um, in the early 1900s, um, wrote a, a, a piece, an essay called Closed Ranks. And in that essay, um, Du Bois instructs black folks to put aside our grievances um, and we should focus on, this is at the time of World War I. And so he says, we should put aside our grievances, focus on winning the war for democracy, and then, and then we will be rewarded um, as a result of our um, investment and effort that we would put into the world in World War I. Um, and so um, Harrison critiques Du Bois to say that you know, it was a foolish demand to make of peoples of African descent. And of course, the hypocrisy of saying we're going to go fight for democracy 
having not experienced it in the United States. Um, so the piece is a playoff of Hubert Henry Harrison's when, when Africa Awakes, because a big part of what I do in this piece is that many of those who are prominent, who have a history of work in the human social service sector, see themselves as friends of peoples of African descent. They see themselves as doing good. And a part of what I argue here is that it is actually the dynamic that emerges from folks that see themselves as doing good that in many ways have contributed to the most harm and have, in many cases, been the most militantly um, defenders and propagators of notions of white supremacy um, as it is manifested, um, particularly as I talk about in the human social service sector. And then kind of the last preface before I jump right into it, one of the things that I mentioned in the publication is this notion of being at war with the methodological um, and with the, with the methodological infrastructure, architecture of the human social service sector. And that notion of war for I think many people sounds extreme. One of the things that I pull from, um, there was a conference in the, well, there's a discipline that emerged during the European Renaissance. Uh, of Egyptology. It was, an, it was an academic discipline that emerged for the purpose of theorizing Egypt out of Africa. Because the, <laughs> the, the advancements of Egypt were so profound and undeniable that in order to perpetuate the project of European domination of the world, to justify enslavement, Africa, Egypt, could not have been attributed to folks of African descent. And so this discipline emerged during the European Renaissance and so when you think about many of the foundational scholars in Western philosophy um, and political thought, um, whether you're talking about um, Hegel, who described Africa as not having had history ever happen in it, um, you know, whether you're talking about uh, Marx, who described um, African, ancient African societies as um, primitive um, societies, um, you can go through the list, Immanuel Kant, um, you know, you can go through the list of some of the more foundational scholars of European political thought um, that embedded in much of it are notions of, of anti-African um, biases that run parallel to the emergence of this notion uh, or this discipline of Egyptology. Um, and so what begins to happen over time is that scholars of African descent then fight back against that. Um, and really, when you read much of the evidence of the, um, the kind of racial designation of, of the, the, the racial designation of ancient Egyptians, what you'll find is that they're clearly people who you would describe as black people today as were the, the ancient Egyptians. Um, and so there was a conference in 1974, the UNESCO conference in Cairo, Egypt, and it was supposed to be a showdown from the major Egyptologists of that day. Two among them, Sheikh Anta Diop, a Congolese Egyptologist, um, or Sen no, Senegal. Sheikh Anta Diop from Senegal, Teofalo Bingham, a Congolese uh, Egyptologist. And so they spent a few days with a group of about 20 other Egyptologists. And again, folks understood that conference to be the conference to determine what is the racial makeup of the ancient Egyptians. And if you read the notes, if you read the, the minutes, of the UNESCO Conference of 1974, you see that Obenga and Diop um, were far and above their evidence for the claims that they were making of the lineage of the ancient Egyptians being peoples of African descent was so undeniable that it was really that conference that made this notion of Egyptians not being Africa an untenable intellectual position. Um, and so that's where we get more African-centered scholars that emerged after that time in more prominent roles in the academy as a result of the work. And, to, and Diop is, is unique because not only did he use his knowledge of history, I mean, the study of history, but he also um, had a master's degree in astrophysics and used his knowledge. He, he created one of the, the melanin dosage tests where he was able to use some of the actual um, DNA of the ancient Egyptians to determine their melanin composition. Melanin is the pigmentation in one's skin. Um, and so he used both history and other forms of science, um, which is what made the argument that Yacht and Obenga made 
um, such a compelling argument even to those who are resistant to it. Um, and so the reason that I start with that is because that's what I mean when I talk about like being at war with the methodological um, architecture of the human social service sector. It is a sector that is rooted in notions of black inferiority and white supremacy. And then unfortunately, much of the conversations that have been had about in, in our current moment about structural racism and implicit bias in many ways still leaves intact um, the very fundamental notion, the notions that are fundamental to the sector, which are notions of black inferiority or inferiority and white supremacy. So a part of what I'm dealing with and the reason the human social service sector is so important is because billions of dollars go into the sector. And you have institutions who make lots of money off of being presumed to be experts on human suffering, particularly folks of African descent. Um, and so whether you're talking about Johns Hopkins School of Education, the School, the School of Public Health, or you're talking about the University of Maryland School of Social Work, you know, many of the major institutions um, that pride themselves off of their study of human suffering that there are billions of dollars that go into research, that go into the execution of programs. And so those billions of dollars have a political implication to them as well. Because what it does is that it creates a political economy that helps to justify notions of black inferiority and white supremacy, um, that actually frame the kinds of services that are delivered to reproduce many of these notions. So let me first talk about um, the importance of socialization. Um, because a part of what many people, I think, and particularly Americans, I think Americans are uniquely bad at recognizing the role that socialization plays on how you come to exist in the world. Because of the focus on individual people as being separate from the larger social context that they emerge from, there tends to be a lack of recognition that your socialization, the way that you come to understand your relationship to the world, is a major part of how <laughs> one navigates the world politically and otherwise. And so when you think about the kinds of education, the kinds of information that's made available. Um, so let me just give a few examples. <laughs> I was, um, as I mentioned, you know, I was a debater and I should coach debate for a while. And so there's a gentleman at um, a public high school here in Baltimore. Um, this is back in 2008. And he mentioned to me, he said, you know, Davon, Africans were traveling the Atlantic Ocean before Europeans were. And my first thought was, you know, why do we always have to have these conspiracy theories? You know, what does it matter that they did it first? It's not a big deal. Like, that was kind of my initial reaction. And then a few months later, I came across a video on YouTube um, it was a, a lecture by a man named Ivan Van Sertema, um, entitled They Came Before Columbus. And then I eventually read the book um, written by Van Sertema called They Came Before Columbus. And there were two conclusions that I came to as a result of that. The first is that Africans certainly were traveling the oceans before Europeans were. And in fact, um, the Portuguese who had traveled to Africa before many of the other European nations had come in contact with the Moors um, who had had navigational expertise. And in fact, Europeans were some of the only people in the world that thought the world was flat. It was common knowledge of other peoples that the world was round. Um, so, you know, and the evidence is just overwhelming in the book. But the other conclusion I came, because I have to ask myself, why was I so willing to dismiss out of hand this idea that Africans had that level of navigational expertise? And the conclusion I came to, even as a person who's aware but at the time, I was very aware of the systems of racism and white supremacy and the level of oppression that it causes. I had never encountered narratives of people of African descent mm -hmm. operating at, in, in, in situations marked as high levels of civilization. I had never encountered that in my own socialization. Mm -hmm. So it made it difficult for me to imagine that Africans historically had the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's one example of what socialization does is that there's certain narratives that if they're not made available to you, the notions of black inferiority are actually pretty rational. Mm. Even if you think about, you know, I went to, um, I mentioned I went to Towson University, and so when you think about the, the implicit message you get that when the professional folks that work there are whiter 
and the service staff are blacker and browner, and you never talk about it, mm -hmm. right? It's something that just would naturally produce, even in many cases subconsciously, this notion of black inferiority, right? So it's important to recognize the way in which socialization impacts the, the realm of possibilities to imagine certain things in the world. Mm -hmm. And as, as I mentioned earlier, that's the, so when we think about notions of black inferiority, it, notions of black inferiority, inherent black pathology, inherent criminality, are images and representations that are made the most available to us in a popular American culture about peoples of African descent. So that being said, when we think about the human social service sector, we're talking about professionals who, who many of them have not disabused themselves of internalizing those notions of black inferiority. And so what you have as a result are programs being developed from the vantage point of black folks is inherently pathological and that the solution is for folks outside of our community to go and help those inferior black folks that don't have the ability to help ourselves. Like that's the inherent frame that is the mainstream perspective of the human social service sector as it endeavors to provide and deliver human services. And so a part of what also happens um, in thinking about these notions uh, of pathology, um, and so in the piece I cite um, several um, pieces, several um, scholars um, who talk about navigating these notions of inherent pathology and how they manifest themselves. Um, and so Andrew Billingsley, who was a scholar at Howard University back in the 60s and 70s, he actually critiques a study that was done um, by two white gentlemen who described, and they did, a, a, I think they said a nine month um, intensive study where they lived amongst black folks um, in what they call the, the urban ghetto. And their conclusion, the conclusion that these scholars, and they describe themselves as militant integrationist. Um, and again, you'll see this in the piece, the piece that I'm referring to. Um, and what they, their conclusion, quote, was that there was no pluses and ghetto Negro culture. That was the conclusion they came to. That, and what they described as ghetto Negro culture um, that was only filled with despair and nihilism, right? So, so you're talking about folks who are professionals, supposed to be professionals at studying human suffering, and in this case, they're talking about people who are supposed to be professionals at studying black folks, and people who see themselves as meaning well for black folks. The, the, the intellect, the scholarly conclusion they come to is that there's no pluses, quote, in, in ghetto Negro culture. I would argue that that is actually descriptive of the collective American consciousness today. And in fact, there was, um, my, my organization did a debate with a gentleman who was running a nonprofit organization, um, a white man who, who was a person who I've worked with um, and think, I, and a person I think is, means well. So we did a debate kind of on the impact of white adults um, with black children in many nonprofit settings. And so, you know, we went back, it was a friendly debate, and one of the students in this person's program stood up and he said, you know, Dave, I think you're really being hard, um, you know, that there are a lot of white people that really want to help us. And she said, you know, I see our community like people who are drug addicts and drug addicts can't help themselves, they need other people to be able to help them. Um, and so, now of course the analogies are perfect for folks who are familiar, uh, you know, with mm -hmm. drug addiction. But my response to her, I said, okay, you, you've characterized what you see are some of the difficulties that peoples of African descent have faced. What are the gifts of, of peoples of African descent? She had a hard time coming up with it. And so a part of what I'm suggesting is that when you think about socialization, you're talking about peoples of African descent who are socialized to only see blackness as a problem to be fixed. And so all cultures, culture is a totality of thought and practice from which a people sustains itself, celebrates itself, 
introduces itself to history and humanity, provides technologies of governance, of approaches to medicine, child rearing, and all cultures have that. But in a society that sees black folks as a problem and sees African descended people as having no history, no, no substantive history, as having no culture that could be seen as a resource and not merely just a marker of disadvantage, it creates a context where those of us of African descent are having to be socialized in a society where our only pathway to notions of human dignity are the extent to which we enter into European culture and traditions. And so as a result, it creates a context where the development of the human services that are delivered are structured in such a way as to give young people access to European culture, prox the proximity to white institutions, as the primary access to improving their quality of life. And so a part of what that does is that it creates a dynamic where when you think about which black folks are given platforms or put in charge of major institutions, it is usually those that help to um, affirm the ways in which white society tends to consume images and narratives of black people. Um, there's a text by a woman named Sadia Hartman. She wrote a book called Scenes of Subjection. And in it, she actually describes um, the way in which spectacles of violence of black folks and, and how it's rendered in Hollywood. So when you think about many of the movements of the movies about enslavement, um, apparently I think one just came out about Harriet Tubman. And what she describes is that a lot of times folks equate enslavement primarily to the spectacle of brutality that we associated with it. You know, the being whipped and the, you know, the images and narratives of brutality, as opposed to the very structure of enslavement itself. Like the very structure that people do not own their own bodies, do not own their own person. And what Sadia Hartman argues is that the American mainstream consumes images of black suffering similar to how people consume horror movies. Right, that it is all, and it's the way in which that consumption of that suffering is not necessarily an affirmation of the humanity of those that are suffering, but it's an engagement with the spectacle of brutality that then makes black suffering a spectacle. And when even when you think about uh, many of over the past few years, like the issue of police brutality and the deaths of black people at the hands of law enforcement. I would argue that what was at play was America's uh, appetite for the consumption of black suffering and notions of black suffering being the primary way in which black folks are understood and consumed. And so when you think about that in the context of the human social service sector, that a lot of times suffering and the spectacle of suffering is often the mode that is used to encourage people to invest in organizations that serve. Uh, black folks. And again, if that is the framework that black suffering is the primary uh, chamber in which black folks are understood, then that is the nature of the kinds of services that will be provided, and that is the kind of leadership that will be assigned to institutions tasked with dealing with peoples of African descent. Dr. Joanne and Elmer Martin, um, they're the founders of the Great Blacks and Wax Museum here in Baltimore City. What a lot of people don't know is that they actually are both social workers, and in fact wrote two books that actually use in this piece. One is The Black Experience of Social Work, and the other one is Spirituality and the Black Helping Tradition. In The uh, Black Experience in Social Work, which they co-wrote together in 1995, um, Dr. Joanne and Elmer Martin, they talk about the emergence of social work in the United States. And what they describe is that, particularly during the Great Migration, right, in the 19-teens, 1920s. Uh, we had, you know, the Great Migration where you had a lot of folks who moved as a result of seeking employment in the urban cities um, that had already begun, um, and began, the Industrial Revolution kind of began to solidify. You had people pursuing jobs in many of these northern cities. And a part of what they describe is a helping tradition. So you're talking about post-emancipation, so a couple of generations after emancipation, um, and so you had just a lot of trauma um, and pain and many needs that needed to be met. And in many ways, the black church was a hub 
for the needs that black folks had at the time. And so they studied some of the traditions um, that black folks, and particularly black church, had developed um, that were important in being able to help black folks deal with the trauma that folks had experienced. Um, and so she described it as the black healthy tradition, the use of music, the use of communal fellowship, um, along with other things that she describes as a part of the black healthy tradition. At the same time that is happening, the emergence, the emergence of uh, social work is kind of emerging at the same time. And so black social workers had a choice to make as to whether or not they were gonna derive their fundamental foundation in their practice from the black helping tradition or from the kind of professionalized sector of social work that had been emerging at the time. And they argue that black social workers make the mistake of embracing the kind of professionalized approaches to social work that embrace many of the distortions of black life and dominant culture as their primary approach to practice and as a result, didn't use the cultural resources of the black healthy tradition mm -hmm. that could have been deployed and professionalized in ways that would provide effective tools for social change. Mm -hmm. um, and so she describes that moment as being the moment where there was a rejection of the notion of using the practices and the methodologies that black folks had developed as a resource and instead decided again, instead decided to go with the status quo. Um, and so I think that's a lot of what we see today. One other example that I want to give, because um, so a part of what happens as a result of these notions of black pathology and black inferiority, black people are not understood generally as having intellectual and methodological resources that can be used to address human problems. And so what I argue is that there are lots of resources that can solve many of these problems that are left off of the table as a result of these notions of inferiority, that in fact, people don't think it's possible. And in fact, one of the things that I discuss is that when you think about education research professionals, many of them have not studied the, the education practices prior to integration, because the assumption is those segregated black schools didn't have anything that folks could learn from in terms of how to effectively teach children, right? Which, when you think about it logically, you're talking about people that had to teach black, black, in many cases, black teachers that had to teach black children in very difficult circumstances. We should certainly want to understand what were some of the approaches they use in education and learn from them today. Um, and so, one of the examples that I'm gonna give, and it's a very controversial example, but I think it's a, it, it makes the point. Um, so one of the examples I give is of Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam, right? And I give it as an example of them developing a human development framework that if you look at the impact it has had on taking black men in particular who were engaged in petty criminal activity, right? Who were addicted to many, who were addicted to drugs, that, they, that the, Elijah Muhammad developed what was a human development framework that, that was able to transform many black men from that state of being credit criminals and dealing drugs to people that were highly effective contributors to society. And that not for the purpose of proselytizing, but for the purpose of studying, what did they do that was so transformative for the folks that came through their program? And when you study, Particularly their theology is, is one of the things that folks kind of poke the most fun of, where they describe, you know, the black man as God, and they describe the white man as the devil. And I think a lot of times, one of the things that happens in the society, particularly I think the phenomenon of white guilt, is that there's a tendency to zero in on the white man as the devil part from a very literal perspective, and again, not understanding it from a human development approach. And what I, what I mean by that is this, is that if you think about the 1950s and 60s, and you think about the overt messages of white supremacy that were at play at the time, and then you think about the religious practices of many people, um, black folks who many of them had white Jesus um, kind of on their walls, that had the impact of black folks not having the ability to see white society in general as having done something wrong to them, right? That the oppression that black folks faced was a natural element of their condition. 
So the whole notion of the white man is the devil, the purpose of it from a human development perspective is you needed something so extreme to knock out the way in which black folks have been socialized to deify white folks and to say that the black man is God as a way to lift up black people. And then and, and I think brilliantly, brilliantly use some of the biblical texts, the Quranic texts, in ways that mirror the condition of black people. So when they talk about escaping the Red Sea, right, they're talking about going through Selma, right? And when you and so they're using brilliantly the metaphors of biblical texts, putting it in the context of the condition that black people found ourselves during that time and then using it as an order to create a program that was as transformational as it was. And again, the point that I make in the paper, again, it's not to proselytize, it's not, you know, not a member of the Nation of Islam, but I make the point that we should study what they were able to do that was so transformative to the men that came through that program. Um, and so again, I think a part of what happens, in a, and there's a political economy to many of these ideas, that if we begin to look at the programs and methodologies that peoples of African descent have developed in these various fields, it undermines the current thought leadership that exists in the sector that has tremendous amounts of resources connected to it. And so um, where, I, where, I, where I will end is the question of why confrontation? Because, um, you know, LBS, we get a rap sometimes for being described as being aggressive or abrasive. Um, we've even had folks highly placed in the philanthropic sector that has described us as like hating white people. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, just a, an interesting story, a mentor of mine was at a meeting and she called me, um, this was back in like 2014, she called me, she said, Dave, I have a dumb question to ask you, but I gotta ask you. She said, do you all work with white people? <laughs> and I was like, Adar, that is a dumb question. You know, of course, you know. She said, well, I'm at a meeting where I'm being sworn up and down that you all just won't do that. And the reason why I tell that story is because a part of what happens is that those of us that talk about black self-determination, that critique the nature of racism and white supremacy, particularly those of us that critique those who see themselves as friends of black people are often characterized as hating white people, as being aggressive, as being you know, a pathological affinity towards violence and aggression. And, and so what tends to happen is that people are socialized to veer away from that. You're told that you're not gonna get a job or no one's gonna work with you if you take these kinds of positions. And so some will wonder then why I say, why be so confrontational in this piece and why talk about a war with the human social service sector and its practices. And the reason for that is because as we talk about the power that this sector has over the way that black folks are socialized, that after integration, and you have major white institutions, many of the nonprofit institutions, that set the agenda for how peoples of African descent are socialized, many of them knowing nothing, and in fact, having in their mind distortions of people of African descent, being tasked with helping to socialize folks who are supposed to be health, healthy and self-sufficient, that there's a political economy that if that is uncovered, right, if it ever becomes a mainstream position, that those who are in charge of the institutions tasked with socializing black folks should not only disabuse, them, disabuse themselves of notions of black inferiority, but need to go back and rigorously study the works that people of African descent and others have developed um, in terms of being able to properly serve, to even be qualified. And a big part of what I mentioned in the paper is that the past 50 to 60 years, the human social service se sector and its thought leadership have been utter failures. But many of those folks that are in those positions are not used to being in a place where they're held accountable and told that. I give one example of a person I give in the, in the text is Bob Embry and his support of the Boys of Baraka, which is a program in the documentary, and Thread, which is a program that still exists. And I describe him as having a penchant for the kind of white saviorism that is a part of the collective psychology of the human social service sector. And I argue that it is folks like him and other people positioned, who are positioned as thought leaders, who are rarely ever held accountable for the fact that they have been in charge primarily of the institutions that socialize black youth and that they themselves 
don't have a rigorous knowledge of the history of peoples of African descent, except for their knowledge of the problems that we face in our community. So many of them can describe incarceration rates, rates and unemployment rates. They can talk about many of the problems and in terms of rigorously studying, what have peoples of African descent done? What have peoples of color done in terms of addressing the problems in our own community? Um, that many of the folks that are thought leaders in the sector would otherwise, in any other situation, would be described as unqualified to hold that position they hold. And so the reason the confrontational aspect of it is so important is because they're so used to being in positions of, of power where to oppose them is for them to marshal um, folks to oppose, folks to challenge people's ability to penetrate their power. And so we're talking about this in terms of a question of shifting power, not merely just a difference in opinion, but folks whose livelihoods, folks whose political machines are predicated on the constant, the, 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 what currently exists as the thought leadership um, in the sector. Um, and so a part of that confrontation, as I described at the top of Obenga and, and, and Diop, challenging the Egyptologists, that that is akin to what this confrontation is about, is we have to change the mainstream approach mm -hmm. to what people see um, as the human social service sector, and it has to be one that understands the power that is involved um, so that we can shift from the methodologies that currently see our community as a pathology to organizations and formations that have immersed themselves in the community have methodologies that have a track record of working in the places that they've been carried out, um, and really create an ecosystem of services, an ecosystem of institutions, such that can help to undermine, disrupt um, notions of white supremacy and black inferiority, and to create a kind of affirming, self-sustaining approach to human service that sees peoples of Africa as human beings, that sees us and our capability in ways that the collective American conscious, consciousness has made difficult for some folks to even really imagine, um, and to move to a phase where we can actually see substantive improvements in the quality of life of black folks. And again, a part of what this paper is about is helping people to answer the question, why haven't things changed very much, given all the resources that have been poured into many of these services? And so I argue that it is this fundamental architecture of the human social service sector being rooted in white supremacy and black inferiority that give you your answer as to why things haven't changed very much. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you.